that better? Everyone can hear me? I'll try not to talk too loud. Is everyone in the right place? This is a Crow OS meetup. <laughs> yeah, so I won't be showing any AIX. Um, okay, so this is this is on, and then there's a. So we're going to talk about uh, building uh, distributed systems, mainly from an infrastructure side. But we're also going to talk about deploying applications this way. Can everyone see that? Let me get big enough. That good? I'll make it bigger once we start typing. So uh, I'm going to talk about building distributed systems with uh, CoreOS. Um, I think they want me to record my screen, so give me a second and I'll start a recording really quick. Uh, this is quick time. Quick time, so we'll start a new recording. New movie recording. Oh, wow. <laughs> Not me. The screen. The screen. New screen. Wow, well, new screen recording. All right, sweet. Hit this. All right. I believe we're recording our screen. If not, sorry. All right. So building distributed systems with CoreOS. You guys are at a CoreOS meetup. Hopefully you guys know what CoreOS is, but a lot of times at these meetups, new people come out so they can learn a little bit about CoreOS. <laughs> Unfortunately, I won't be talking about CoreOS, the operating system, too deeply, but I will be talking about the collection of components how you put them together to actually do something useful, right? Because this is the whole purpose of adopting these technologies. Um, some goals. All right, so the goals here are mainly to uh, give you an overview of distributed computing infrastructure, like what bits do you need to kind of set the stage for this stuff. Um, then we're gonna do a, live, a lot of live demonstrations on like CoreOS itself, um, tools like Fleet, and ultimately Kubernetes, which ties it all together to kind of give us this application management platform, um, if the demos work. Um, and the other part is to like demystify all of this stuff, right? It looks like there's a lot of moving pieces. So today I'm going to deploy each piece one by one so we can see what they all look like. So I'm going to avoid using like these scripts that are like, hey, stand everything up, it's like magic. I'm going to do less magic, and we're just going to like deploy everything bit by bit so we see how it actually works. It's the talk of building. Um, here's the question that you need to keep in your mind when you're thinking about a system like this. Um, imagine you had to design your infrastructure, but no one could ever log into it. Right? There's no SSH at all. How would you build this? So the analogy I like to use is that today we manage infrastructure and the servers that we use. They're general purpose operating systems. Right? You log into your Linux server and there's like a Bluetooth daemon running. Like how many people use the Bluetooth on their servers? Not a lot. Right? So the idea is that we want to treat servers like we do a gaming console. If you guys are familiar with like the Xbox or a PlayStation. The games that you build for an Xbox or PlayStation, you don't build games on an Xbox. You actually have a dev machine that's super powerful. You build your game, you render it, and then you get like a CD or um, a, something you can download from the web, and you deploy that to the PlayStation, right? So the, the, the production deployment for a game is a slip, slim down, um, console or computer that only has is focused on doing that. This is what we want to do with our infrastructure. So we're going to talk about distributed systems a little bit. How many people are familiar with distributed systems? Everyone? Like all you guys went to school for computer science, PhD in distributed systems? This is going to be a hard talk for me. You guys are like, no, that's not how logical clocks work. Like, that was my PhD thesis. Well, you guys just get to be mad if I get some of the terms wrong. Right? Just wiggle a little bit if you think I'm doing it wrong. Um, so the way I like to describe some of this stuff is at a very high level is that distributed systems are a collection of servers usually connected by a network that we can treat as a single system. Now that's when the problems get really, really hard, right? If you're on a single server, it's easy to have consistency because you only got one server. But if you're to do this across multiple servers, then we get to the hard problems that allow the white papers attempt to help us solve some algorithms and patterns. So one of the things we want in the system is scalability, right? So if we had a single system, kind of like a mainframe, you can hot plug in more memory and CPU and kind of scale the system that way. In a distributed system, we would have to add more nodes to the system, and we need a way to add those nodes into the system and grow the capacity. And then highly available, you know, a job dies, we want that to kind of move. Ideally, it moves in an automated way. And then fault tolerance, right? This is a very um, important feature for a lot of these things. A lot of people have data stores that aren't necessarily fault tolerant, but bad node comes onto the network, it can corrupt the entire database. That's a bad thing to happen. So we try to mitigate this a bit by using something like etcd to store our data. So we make some trade-offs on some performance and speed 
in order to gain some fault tolerance by using the RAP protocol that can detect these packages <coughs> and prevent them from updating the consensus that we have on the network. And then the consistent view. So the consistent view is in line with this idea that we have thousands of machines, <laughs> but we can treat them as a single machine, and we'll see how Kubernetes allows us to do that. A central entry point into this cluster where we stop thinking about a bunch of machines, the individual identities and host names, we think about them as just a collection of resources like you would find in a central system. Uh, there are pros and cons to this, right? So the nice thing about distributed computing, there's a lot of detailed research on how to implement some of these solutions. Um, it's also your best shot at five nines, right? So a question I like to ask a lot is like, how many people know how much time, downtime can you have before you lose five nines? So a lot of people have like PhD thesis that say, how much downtime can you have in one year before you're no longer five nines availability? Five minutes. Like, well, what school did you guys go to? Like, <laughs> should have that one. There you go. So five minutes is about the downtime you have. And a lot of people, you know, they put five nines in their contracts, but they ain't happening, right? You got your developers or ops people running around with pagers, and they're like, yeah, we're going to do five nines. Like, no, you're not. That first outage is going to take you about, I don't know, you wake up really fast, you plug in your machine, you type a bunch of stuff, and you're done, you get three minutes and 30 seconds. You're still good, but you got a minute and 30 seconds for the rest of the year. So <laughs> you're going to be screwed, right? It's like a little clock that sits with you. Um, so the cons are, though, is uh, increased complexity, right? So I show people etcd, and they're like, oh, sweet, key value store. I'm like, not as accurate. You know, there, it's hard to maintain one of these systems because um, things like quorum become important, right? You know, you lose the majority of nodes, and things just stop to a halt. And they're like, oh, that's not cool. It should just keep going. It's like, no, 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 we can't corrupt the data. We need a majority of nodes online to, to give you the consistency guarantees that we're promising here. And that's a culture shock for a lot of people. It's like, no, I put stuff in Redis all the time. And I can just read it back out. And I'm like, yeah, just trust us on this one. Um, and then there's a steep learning curve, right? So you go to a customer and they're like, I want to do stuff in real time. I was like, what does that mean to you? And it was like, I put a value in there at 3.30 a.m. and I want to get it back at 3.30 a.m. and it should be the right value. I was like, ugh, wall clock time is hard, right? Unless you're Google and you got atomic clocks and GPS systems to make up for the speed of light of the, the request you made and, on, and know how far you are, it's not going to work out to be using real time. So we have to use a logical clock in NCD. And whoa, logical clock, what does that mean? I want real time. I was like, well, the best we can give you is that if you ask for a value at index one, that's your logical timestamp for the cluster, we'll guarantee you that at logical timestamp one, the database password is food. Well, how do I get the newest password? It's like, oh, logical timestamp two. Well, what time does that map to? It's like, I don't know, some point in the future, right? You talk to, to PhD students, like, hey, it could be to the end of the universe. They're like, that's a long time. <laughs> like, yeah, so don't sit around and wait for it, right? You just have to um, you know, follow the patterns. And then the other part, part is about distributed computing is your software needs to be designed to handle the failures. Now, a lot of people just don't want to do that. They just want things to go down and the whole world stops and everyone gets up and just fixes it manually. Um, but the thing is, in the distributed system, especially if you have like, a lot of automation, and what we're going to show today is an automated cluster manager, that thing's going to bring things up fast. So if you have an app that's like deleting people's bank accounts, the cluster manager is like, hey, delete bank account, turn it off. No, nope, turn it back on. Delete, turn it off. No, nope, turn it back on. So <laughs> if you're not handling these failures, you're just going to delete the entire balance of Germany in like 15 minutes. So you have to pay attention to these software failures when you're designing applications that will really participate in a distributed system and, and adopt all these properties. So let's talk about the building blocks. That's the focus of this uh, talk today. Um, one building block that makes it really easy. So really, containers have nothing to do with distributed computing on their own, right? A lot of people are like seeing Docker for the first time or some type of container runtime. And it's like, yes, now I'm distributed. I'm doing distributed computing because I put my stuff in containers. I'm like, not really. You just traded app git or yum for Docker pool. And you traded service MySQL start for Docker run MySQL. You haven't moved the needle at all, man. And they're like, oh, sad. But it's not that sad. Um, the good thing is you provided some abstraction so that the scheduler doesn't have to worry about the differences between Ruby and Java. It can just say, oh, you have an application. I'm going to schedule that application. What we really want to talk about is that the application needs this much CPU, it needs this much memory, and it needs these ports. Then we can actually start talking about things at the right level. Right now, a lot of people focus on, oh, you want to deploy that app? 
first install Ruby, once it's installed, do gem install, so, like that's a waste of time. Well, you don't want a scheduler worrying about those things, it's not important. So let's just package those things in a container and then we can move on to the more important things in, in a cluster. So once we have this abstraction, uh, a lot of people believe that containers are magical, right? They believe they open it, a unicorn will pop out and fly around and solve all their problems. But the thing is you open a container, there'll be nothing in there but a tarball, your application and the config file. There's nothing exciting there. And it still runs on the operating system, right? So people want to take a magical container and deploy it to the cloud. And I was like, the cloud has real servers, like there's real servers that live there. Um, so we got to deploy it on an operating system. And we'll talk about CoreOS in general to be that operating system that's really slimmed down and focused on running those containers. And there's a network. What we're going to do today is we want all of our containers to be first class citizens on the network, right? Some people's initial experience with some of these containers are if you use some of the default networking stacks that we find, um, you'll notice that you get like a dynamic bridge that has nothing to do with the other machines in the cluster, so they can't talk to each other. That really messes up the patterns that we want to achieve. So what we want is every container to get a first class IP address in the cluster. And once we do that, then these containers can talk to hosts, containers can talk to other containers, and then we can take advantage of things like L3 routing where we can go across data centers and have everything become a first class citizen. Now, once everything becomes a first class citizen at the IP level, we don't have to do things like port maps, right? Like, well, you get port 80, why are you using port 80? You make this other server stop. That, that is a nightmare and there's no reason for that. We have enough IPs, especially start talking about IPv6. And then uh, we want some consensus, right? So there are people that are building distributed systems on top of Redis and it's really, really sad because you know, they don't actually see consistent views of the world. So we use etcd to do this and we build other tools on top. And then you need a scheduler. So how many people have a scheduler in their network automating things at their office? All right, one, one, two people. How many people have ops people? where they work, right? Or some developers that do deployments. You guys just don't have software, then you're just here like, man, I was going to a cooking class, but you guys were open. All right, so, so what, what a scheduler does for a lot of people is this thing that makes a decision where the app runs, right? So some people have an automated one, there's like two people that have an automated one, and the rest of you have like these uh, human beings that are your scheduler. And what those human beings do is they figure out the set of apps applications your company has, and then they um, record where that application runs in their database. It's usually a spreadsheet, Excel. They, they get your request, they map it to a machine that says, this app will run on machine, Yoda, Star Wars.com, very special machine. I named it myself. And this is what they do. They kind of schedule applications this way. It's highly inefficient. But if they're on call, they're highly available. So it's not that bad. But we want to take all that ops things that people do and encapsulate it into the tools. That's what Kubernetes attempts to do. You know, figure out how do you schedule something to a machine? How do you keep it running? And then just take those patterns and, just produce and push them into the system. So what's a container? Um, a lot of people are familiar with containers, but I think a lot of people got off to a bad start. So one thing I like to do is a bit of level setting on what a container is. So a container to me is not a golden image, right? The goal here is not to take a, a physical machine or a VM and then wrap it up in a container. And unfortunately, a lot of people started their life in the container world was a Docker file. And they said, from Ubuntu, so we're going to start off with a gig, and then we're going to put our one meg worth of my app in place. And then we got two gigs and a meg, and that becomes your application, right? And that's like crazy trying to distribute that around. And it makes no sense because you probably... Emacs in your, uh, in your Docker. Yeah, well, you might need Emacs in your Docker image, right? You know, you might want to log in, like you want to log into the app. It's kind of crazy. So, if you think about a container, for me, what helps is to say a container is just a Unix process, because that's all it is, with some containment features from the kernel. It's like, hey, I want to launch this process, but before you do, give me my own mount namespace, so I can actually only see a small section of the world. Give me my own network namespace, so I can have my own IP address and have my own view of the network world. Um, you also contain a few other things. And it just says, I'm going to, and then, you know, true root, and you have my own mount system. And now you kind of have this isolated box. It's not a security feature but it's going to kind of protect you um, and provide some of the same functionality people have been adopting virtual machines for. Like a lot of people right now are using virtual machines for the simple problem of I have shared libraries. Two of my apps want to use the same library. I can't figure it out. So you know what? We just put an app in a whole machine by itself and we call it the cloud, right? And we'll have 50 of these so I can deploy different versions of my apps. To me, this is like the primary use case I see, especially for like Linux people. Like, why are you doing this? So to me is um, an application container 
should just be an application plus its dependencies. I happen to write a lot of code in Go. In that case, I just have the statically linked else binary that are dropped in the container. So my container is like 14 megs. What's the alternative to having your one gig with Ubuntu that you start with in the dump? All right, so the question was, what's the alternative to having a one gig with Ubuntu with dump? So there's different build tools like build root. So in the embedded programming space or like smaller devices, you can't be doing that. You may not have that much storage. So what you want to do is you can use a different build system that will say, you know what, what do you want to use? So you want to use Python. We'll bring in Python. You want to add your apps in there and maybe some uh, dynamic libraries that you're linking against mm -hmm. for your libraries. You can take that and subtract your build root. And now you're left with maybe 20, 25 megs worth of stuff. If you start with Ubuntu, you're going to start with AppGit, GCC, Bluetooth, some people even leave GNOME in there. Like, are you going to launch a desktop in your container? Like, please stop this. Um, so there's a slightly better way of doing it. So runtime environment is the final thing that your, your um, container runtime gives you. So one of the most popular ones is Rocket, right, or Docker. And then there's Rocket from Core OS. And the goal of those are to take that root file system, which is the tarball and the config file, look at those things, lay them down on the image, and tell the kernel, look, contain this based on the specification the user gave us. We can represent that on command line flags, or we can use an API. But in our case, we're going to wrap a cluster manager around this to make that a little easier to work with. All right, CoreOS, I'm not going to go into more detail. You guys are at a CoreOS meetup. You, have, you should at least visit the website. So at a very high level, it's a container-optimized Linux distribution, meaning we have none of the stuff um, by default. Um, we start with Linux, System D. System D is like a bad word in the US. I'm not sure on this side of the world. But if I say System D out loud, man, people like have heart attacks and die. It's like, it's just System D. And they're like, System D. So I like, what um, and, and a container runtime. And there's no package manager. This is the fun part. Like sometimes I don't tell like sysdat and friends, like, hey, they're kicking the tires with uh, CoreOS, and I just start grinning. They log in, and they're like, App yet. And I was like, nah, there's no app. <laughs> Yum install, I'm like, nah, there's no, you know. What am I going to do? The system is dead to me. I'm like, well, you know, do you really need a package manager? Um, that's a surprise. Um, and since there's no package manager, that means we don't install any packages that we expect you to depend on. So there's no Ruby, there's no Java, there's no Python. Given that, the contract between you and the operating system is really small. We will execute your containers. And given that, we can do automatic updates in the background because we don't have a large contract with you. The kernel will work, that's pretty stable, and we do this update. Then we have a read-only file system. So even if we had a package manager, you couldn't install anything anyway, right? Because that's our space. You can put things under opt, but you're not putting anything for a core application stuff. And then we, for the benefits of all this, since we're small and our contract is small, we do rolling up releases. And this is mind-blowing to people that are using Red Hat. Like Red Hat has like 200 year support on rail four or five. Like they're gonna support it forever. Like it's supposed to have an end of life and it's like, you know what? Another 10 years support. So I think Red Hat will be older than people's children and it's just gonna keep running rail four, Java like one, and who cares? For us, we don't have that problem because we don't have people depending on our stuff. So we can roll kernel like 3.19.3. And people are like, wow, you can do that? I was like, yeah. And then like on kernel one, it's called the Linus release. I'm like, no, 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 we move very far into the future. So we keep those things up to date. All right, so the next component you need is etcd. And at a high level, etcd is the central thing that we bootstrap things first, at least the way I like to do it. I stand up a central etcd cluster, and it can be three to five nodes, depending on how much uh, time you want to have before your cluster stops making progress, accepting new values and, and getting consensus and saving them. And it's built on the RAC protocol. All you PhD students in here, y'all know what the RAC protocol is. But it's a simple way for us to have a standardized way of a replicated log. We get a value to a leader, it's a single leader system. You hit the single leader, it replicates to a majority of its peers. It gets consensus that they're all going to write that value at that particular um, logical clock implementation. Bring it back, we save it, tell the client we're good. All right? So if anyone else is doing reads from any of the slaves, they can request a consistent read and they'll go through consensus or they can use our sequential consistency pro uh, process. Our central consistency promise is that if you're watching the key at index one, even though it will take some time to get you um, the next value, when two comes, you're gonna get the same value that the rest of the cluster agrees on, right? We can guarantee you that using that particular index. Um, so we put that into the center of the cluster. Then we can build tools on top of it, right? 
So one of the tools that we built on top of etcd is Flannel. Flannel is the thing that provides the configuration for networking in the cluster. So we have many machines. What we do for efficiency is that we take a larger IP subnet, slash 8, and we take that and we carve it into very small slash 24 networks, right? So let's say we can get 200 some odd um, slash 24 networks. We can give those to each host. You may slice it up a little smaller if you have more hosts. Or you can go to IPv6. Um, so the idea there is that we have Flannel. We carve up a larger subnet, subnet into smaller subnets, and we assign each of them to a host. Now, once we do this, we have to start routing, we have to start updating routing tables on each of the hosts and know if a container comes up on host B and has this part of the subnet, it has no way of knowing that when a request comes from another machine that has another part of the subnet, how to get there. So what, what Flannel does, it, it updates the route tables on each host. So we can, we can pick any random arbitrary IP range and Flannel will handle the route entries so that way we know how to get there, right? This is basic static route stuff. But we need something to configure that. But we also need every node to agree on what the routes are for everyone, right? So each node comes up independently and says, hey, here's my IP address. I'm taking this subnet <coughs> image because it's free. We agree that it's free thanks to the etcd. And then this is the next hop of that. So now we get this dynamic real-time um, route table propagation because everyone agrees at a central point. Without one of these things, then you have to get into some of these um, hard to implement routing uh, distribution protocols, OSPF and things like that. So that's what Flannel does for us. It's backed by etcd, gives us cross-host networking, and optionally, you can use it overlay network. When would you want to use an overlay network? If you're in Amazon and they won't give you access to L2, so L2 is like where, you, know, you plug in that ethernet cable and it does some broadcast, DHCP gets an IP address, you can kind of broadcast and re reply to ARP requests, say, hey, well, my network has 192.68.10. Machine can say, hey, well, I do. You can put that in your ARP table, and you can have communication going back and forth because we need to respond to that MAC address. In the cloud, you can't do that. So if we use one of these, if we allocate a new subnet, there's no way we can tell people about it. We've got to rely on routes. A lot of times, that's not easy to do in Amazon. So what we do is we build our own overlay network to provide a way to kind of give ourselves L2 over L2. And this is what Flannel can do, but it's optional. It slows things down to be doing things over UDP. For a little bit of speed, we can move that into the kernel with VXLAN and go a bit faster. This is what you typically see in VMware. This is why VMware's virtual networking is so fast. They use VXLAN. They do a really good job of it because they also have a custom kernel to make sure that this stuff works. Other than that, we'll be using host gateway. So in my setup, I'm mimicking a bare metal setup where everything is about L2. And I'll just be using a subnet that's within the same broadcast domain. But I still need those route entries because the IPs aren't tied to a real interface. All right. So we're getting close to starting the first live demo. And we're going to talk about Fleet. So Fleet, if you think about it, could be looked at as the package manager for CoreOS. It's the thing that allows us to craft systemd units and interact with them. We didn't hear that. Um, <laughs> Interact with them with the cluster. So if you're used to like CoreOS and any system using systemd, you make these systemd unit files, you put it in the right place and say systemd start this thing, and it will start things based on your systemd configuration. But that requires logging into the server. So Fleet allows us to submit that unit to Fleet, and Fleet will pick the best service uh, server in the cluster to run that particular unit. So it has some basic job scheduling primitives built in, but they're not very powerful. And it's also our machine database. So let's look at Fleet in action, and we're going to use Fleet to set up the foundation for our bigger cluster here. We need Docker, and me, I'm, I like the new one shiny, so Docker 1.6 came out last week. So we're going to deploy Docker 1.6 into CoreOS using Fleet, and we're going to also set up Flannel, right? So all these machines were booted um, right ahead of time, so if you look at this, we'll see how many machines we have. So we have four machines. You don't see etcd in the stack, mainly because I don't allow etcd to live in the same fleet cluster because I want no mistakes of scheduling work to um, etcd. People do this a lot. It's funny. They, they show up on IRC and say, hey, my cluster's down. I'm like, I know the problem. You probably are scheduling work to your etcd cluster. I'm like, yeah, and it's star for resources. And guess what? The heartbeats drop, right? So you can't necessarily do your health checks with Raft anymore. Raft freaks out. It goes into leader election mode, trying to elect a new leader, but it still has no resources to do this. And now your cluster's down. Everything stops. Don't put anything on your etcd cluster that I live off in the corner. Here, these are the only nodes that are um, capable of doing work. I just gave them an arbitrary <coughs> label called Kubernetes. So 
now we have this list of machines. I guess you guys all seen what a unit file looks like, and we'll see what the, uh, um, let's just show the Docker one really quick. So here's a Docker unit file. Normally we would just put this on the server, and then Docker would do its thing. So what this is doing, uh, okay, so what this is doing, we want to have Flannel set up a configuration that Docker can use, so we can say, Docker, don't pick some arbitrary IP range. We want to give you an IP range that will actually work across hosts. So we can actually look at this environment file that Flannel will put on this. We read it in thanks to system D, and it's going to turn them into environment variables for us. Then we can run Docker like we're used to, run it in daemon mode. We run ESD4, so we're just going to use the overlay driver so we can kind of get the speed that we got from ButterFS before. We're going to listen on the Docker Unix socket. And then down here, I'm going to say that, you know what, allow unsecured access to this registry. Now that registry runs on my Mac right now. This is beautiful. Docker released a new registry like three days ago. So I built this Mac service for it. It's written in Go. I'm running it on my laptop now, and it's like running as a Mac service. So now I just run this Docker registry locally. So we're going to allow our containers to pull from there. And then here, it's going to get its uh, subnet from Flannel, from the environment file. We're going to set the NTU to make sure that that lines up with the rest of the network. And then we don't want Docker to handle any of the IP tables entries anymore. We're going to let Flannel take care of this. Right? And this is a global unit. So if you haven't used Fleet before, what we can do is say, Fleet, we don't know how many machines are in the cluster, but you know what? All of them need to be running Docker. All right? So we have two global units. We're going to start with Flannel first. So Flannel will get in there. Flannel is going to do its thing, get subnets for all the machines, and then we can deploy Docker. So Fleet, uh, CTL, we're going to start uh, units, Flannel. So there we go. We start the service. And what should happen is Fleet uh, list units. So now we have Flannel running on all the machines in the cluster, right? So how do we know Flannel's working? So I can actually look at etcd to see what the routing table looks like right now. So we can do etcd, uh, let's do, um, just ls the whole thing. So that's the routing table put in by Flannel, right? So each of the nodes come up independently and they talk to etcd. They say etcd um, and they work out between themselves what range they can grab for themselves. They grab one and then what they do is um, this is their IP address of the host itself, or no, this is the network range. And then what they do is they stick their IP address in there. So etcd, etcd, ctl, um, we want to get that. So that particular node, with 102, it grabbed that subnet. So this is how they communicate with each other. So all the other nodes find it and says, oh, this is my next hop. I know how to update my routing table, right? So now we have a distributed routing table. So now that we have final in place, now we have the setup for cross-host networking, we can deploy Docker. So I want to use Docker 1.6. I'm just going to install it under opt. And we just need to make sure that Docker runs on every machine. So SDECT, uh, not SD fleet. Fleet CTL, start units, Docker. All right, so this is also a global service. The nice thing about using global services, if I add 10 more machines later, I don't have to tell the system to do anything else. They'll just all get installed, <coughs> right? So let's see where we're at here. List. All right, so Docker and Flannel are now here. So now we're, we're ready to start using containers. Normally, we do all this bootstrapping in our cloud init, which is the um, way you bootstrap a CoreOS machine. But what we want to do is just show you how all the components stack up. <coughs> all right, so now that we have that going, let's talk about Kubernetes. So Fleet does basic scheduling like that. It can also do like, hey, go exactly to this node. We can also use metadata to influence the scheduler. But it's not very intelligent and we don't plan to make it compete with something like Kubernetes or Mesos. Fleet does a good job at what it does. Keep it that way. So now with Kubernetes, is more interesting, right? You get into, um, if you guys are familiar with the Borg paper that was released, so you guys probably like white papers, right? The Borg white paper that is really worth reading, I read it on the plane right over here, and it talks about how Google manages um, their containers at scale using Borg and some of the lessons learned that are now being put into Kubernetes. This is a fantastic project because it encapsulates their experience, the good parts, and what they would do differently. So it's a container manager, scheduler, and service discovery. Service discovery really is a fantastic way that they've implemented it in Kubernetes. Typically, the way people were doing service discovery is you launch an app and you say, this app specifically is this service. If you want to change it, you've got to break down that whole service definition. This is a pain point. And one of the things they highlight in the paper. So they said, this time we're going to do a service discovery. We're going to make it dynamic. When we launch a container, we're going to give it a set of labels. And then we will say a set of labels 
equals a service. So now you can change the, the meaning of a service at runtime. Add some labels, remove some labels. And the rest of the system can use these label queries to figure out what makes up a logical service. And we'll see what this looks like when we start talking about service IPs and having containers, other apps, find other services by just doing label queries. There's agents that run on all the machines looking for state changes. This is a very awesome pattern. So people that are used to the configuration management world is where you know all the host names, you put them in like an inventory, and you say what their roles are, and then you push out to them. And then you have to push over and over again to enforce that state. Well, Kubernetes has a very similar pattern, except for all the daemons that run in the network, they just watch endpoints. And when their state changes, they take action. Right? So they only watch the endpoints that they care about. This is in line with the rest of the patterns you see in the CoreOS ecosystem. Flannel does the same thing. If one of those nodes were to die, that key will change and it will remove it from its uh, routing table. Right? Um, so we talked about labels, and so the controllers on the network, so in, in Kubernetes, everything is API driven. We put our desired state inside of Kubernetes, and there's various controllers that try to apply that state and keep it that way. So Kubernetes, there's a, four high-level resources that I like to talk about. I mean, there's gonna be more in the future, but these are the four main ones. There's nodes, things that we can schedule to. And nodes have some capacity, like memory, CPU, pretty much anything you can specify in a Linux secret architecture. And then there's pods. Pods are unique, so if you have experience with Docker, you deploy one controller. <coughs> but there's a problem there. Let's say you have an app that will like its own local caching layer, maybe you wanna have memcache be local to it. Well, in Docker's world, you have to kind of deploy both things at the same time. But the automated scheduling might get you in some really silly race conditions, right? You have enough capacity for the first part, but not enough for the other part. So we kind of need to have a way to do a transaction here. So pods can give us a unit that we can schedule as an atomic transaction. And we can specify all the containers that make up our logical application and deploy them as a single unit. And once we can deploy them as a single unit, we can start doing resource bounding on that single unit. This single unit can't use more than this CPU, more than this memory, and we can move them um, in concert. And then there's replication controllers. These are the things that do auto-scaling. We can say, give me three of these pods, five of these pods. You can create custom controllers yourself that do very intelligent things like, the user wants five of these pods, but let's make sure we roll out five of these pods across different failure domains in Amazon. You can put whatever logic you want in there, but by default, there's a very simple one that doesn't know all this. And then there's services. Services is what um, service discovery is built on. Let's see what that looks like. Everything is declarative. So here's what a pod looks like. Here's the pod syntax. Maybe the adjacent object, you're free to just use like curl and just post this to an endpoint. There's command line tools. You're probably going to see a lot of vendors produce GUIs around this stuff. But ideally, you specify what you want. So there's no if statements. This language isn't touring complete. It's just JSON, right? Here's what I want. In this case, I want an app called Awesome App. It's a really awesome app. And where you get the awesome app is from Quay.io, from Kelsey's namespace. And it is port 80. And since we um, get an IP per <coughs> container, we don't have to worry about clashes on the port space. And then we only want to pull this image to the present and restart always. Right? So that's what a positive image looks like. Slides. Now, Kubernetes itself. So those are the objects in the Kubernetes cluster. But how does Kubernetes manage all the objects? So the first thing we need to do is have etcd. We're not going to use the same etcd that CoreOS is using. It's kind of a good idea to probably have this segmented for, for Kubernetes. You know, you may want to have different life cycles as you upgrade these things, all kind of things you want to do. Just don't fall in the trap of having all your eggs in one basket. We're going to have another etcd node or cluster if you want for high available setup just for Kubernetes. And then there's an API server. Now the API server is where everything comes into the cluster. Everything starts there. And now every component in Kubernetes does watches on the API server. This is a very common pattern to scale the number of watches to etcd. So we have people that we're working with that want to have 400 clients, 400,000 clients talk to etcd. It's going to overload etcd. You can't handle that many watches at the same time. Etcd is written in Golang. So while Go routines are cheap, is what we normally do per watch, 400,000 will be tolling a taxi on the system. How do you scale watches? Well, there's a nice paper called Chubby, which NCD is kind of themed off of, and Chubby outlines how you do this. You put proxies at the edge, and those proxies can be smart, they can put caching, they can do all kinds of things. Kubernetes takes this pattern on day one. 
So now all clients watch Kubernetes. So things like liveliness updates, like, hey, I'm alive, I'm alive. Unless there's a state change, the API server never bothers updating NCD. It would just be a waste of time, just saturating writes pointless. So we can have many API servers that are batching these things up and making smart decisions about when to do, actually store that in the cluster. You only want state changes there. Then there's replication controllers. This is an actual daemon that runs on the, on the network that looks at the API server to figure out if there's anything that it needs to be responsible for. Mainly starting pods based on the template and implementing your desired number of those pods that you want running. If there's only two pods and you set three, it's job is to put another one there. Then we have the scheduler, the thing that uh, makes a decision about where things actually run in the cluster. Now, the scheduler in Kubernetes is pretty straightforward and simple. It implements bin packing by default. And in that case, it's not necessarily as efficient as a lot of people want. Right? Because you can go overboard with the scheduler. So in the Mesos world, they have a very rich scheduler. They can take multi-dimensions from the server. They <coughs> schedule based on free CPU, free CPU over time, memory. So there is work right now in the Kubernetes uh, code base to basically be able to do richer scheduling based on the data we get out of C Advisor. So C Advisor is another tool that tracks the container C groups um, metrics. And we can use that to make scheduling decisions in the future. So today, C groups, uh, C Advisor can run in the cluster start aggregating these met uh, metrics, and then we can start scheduling against those metrics. And then the proxy. So the proxy aids in service discovery. So a proxy runs on every Kubernetes host, mainly the workers, and its job is to take these virtual IPs, VIPs, that we will be assigning to services. When, when a request comes in, the proxy will basically intercept that request, do a label query to find all the pods that are responsible for that service IP and then broker the traffic. This is how we're gonna be able to do like zero downtime upgrades. And then it doesn't matter which host you enter the cluster in. So maybe you have a thousand machines, but the pods are only running on two of those machines. Now you have to pay this extra hop cost, but you can hit any machine in the cluster and it knows how to push you to the right place where the pod is actually running. So if the pod ever moves because of failure, that thing is dynamically updated because the VIP doesn't change. The label queries is fixed. You can talk to a, um, Kubernetes and get the new location of all the new pods. And then finally, the kubelet. So the kubelet's job is once things has been scheduled, the job will be put into the kubelet's namespace. And the kubelet is the thing that talks to Docker. And we actually just did a demo yesterday of it being able to talk to Rocket to deploy a container, right? So there's clean separation on um, scheduling the job and then actually running that job. All right, so now what we're going to do is provision those components in Kubernetes. And we're going to use Fleet to get us there. And after that, we'll use Kubernetes to deploy and manage applications. All right, so we have those core services running. So one thing I want to do is I'm going to pin etcd to a specific machine, mainly because it has state. I need that state to stay there. So what I'm going to do now is just do Fleet, um, list machines. So here, I'm going to take this odd man out. And we're going to take that machine ID, which is unique to every machine. Uh, SysMD tries its best to make it so. And we're going to tell this etcd unit for Kubernetes to go to that machine specifically. If I didn't do this, it's just going to pick a random machine there, which is OK. I would just need a little bit more plumbing to tell the other components with the API servers. So we're just going to update the unit file for etcd. We call it kube etcd, so we can be clear in our intentions. So we're saying fleet, this thing needs to go to a machine that's capable of running a Kubernetes component or restrict it to a machine that has this machine ID. Right? So now we can influence the scheduler to our needs. So with this demo, I'm just going to do a one node at CD cluster, you can call it that. And it's just going to listen on localhost because I want the API server just to talk to it on localhost. So we'll save that. So we'll do fleet CTL start units um, kube at CD. And I know it should go to the one with that, that 20, because it's the only one that satisfies the constraint for that particular unit. So now that's running on the other units, mainly let's say the KU API server. You'll notice here that history's constraint is like wherever SCD is running, right? So we don't really need to track the host here. We can even let Fleet figure this out for us. So that's a pretty nice feature. So we'll just do KU, C, uh, not KU CTO, I'm not ready for that yet. We'll do Fleet. Uh, start, Unix, Kube, API server. So we know where that's going to end up. 
And then we'll start adding some of the supporting server components. So now we need that controller manager we talked about. Our coup and our controller. So that comes up, and it should go to the same place because they have the same constraint in place. And then we need, uh, what other component do we need? I don't know. You're the speaker. Okay. Um, so the next component that we need is the scheduler, right? So if you don't start the scheduler, you enter work into the thing, and it's just going to sit there and be like, so, you know, I know what you want, but there's no scheduler to actually do it. So now we have a scheduler in the network. All these components now are ready to start taking work. So our nodes have Docker and them, but they don't have any of the Kubernetes components, mainly the proxy server and the Kubernetes. So let's go ahead and do those. Now, anyone got an idea what type of units those will be? So they need to run anywhere. Global units, right? So these are these won't be spe uh, machine specific. We'll just do uh, doesn't matter what order from this one. So we'll do the proxy. So there's a global unit there. And then we'll do the kubelet, right? So those are global units, right? So what it looks like now is we do list units. So we just use list unit files. So you'll see that some of them are global units. And the global units, if any other machine joins this fleet cluster, they're going to get those things installed by default going forward. So we don't need to track that. And that's great for our workers. The Kubernetes components are actually launched on specific machines. Another nice thing about Fleet is you can use Fleet to get the logs for um, things deployed. Um, so we can say, give me the journal logs for Kube um, etcd. So we connect to that machine that's running it, and we can see the journal output, right? Again, you don't have to log into the server. You can do, and this doesn't work for global units, because right now, like, which one are you need, right? So we have to figure out how to scope that down to the actual uh, unit running on a specific machine. All right, so now we have Kubernetes up and running at this point. So now we use Fleet to provision a Kubernetes cluster. So at this point, we can use the kubectl command. So Kubernetes is pretty cool, mainly because um, you can manage multiple clusters at a time. So they have this config file where you can specify a list of clusters. So I have like my own personal cluster. There's a CoreOS cluster. There's some demo clusters. And what I can do is keep them all in this one place. You can also manage your credentials here if you're using like client SSL search or a basic auth or a token. Um, that can also live in this file. And then all you have to do is set the context. So if you want to work on a different cluster, you can just say kubectl set the context and it will just switch it. So with that up, we should see, um, so we deployed all those other components. So what we see is that there's going to be a few services by default. So there's two services by default. So we're doing some work now to make Kubernetes be able to deploy itself. It's so meta. Like Kubernetes Kubernetes will start. It'll start a replication controller, which will then spawn an etcd, which will then spawn an API server, which will then spawn another replication controller that kills the one that started it before, and then it will be self bootstrapped into the network. Right? It's just go with people with extra time. That's what 20% time gets you. Um, so there's a service entry for the API server so the other components can find it. So now that we have that, we can actually see if there's any pods running. So get pods. No pods running. But we should expect some nodes to be there. There isn't. Right? So one thing you can do in Kubernetes is, if I wanted to register some nodes, I could just enter them on the command line or use the API. But this is manual, right? And the Kubernetes API is so flexible, I can just write my own little service. So I wrote a little tool called Kube Register. It has nothing to do with the Kubernetes project. It's something that I wrote on my own that talks to Fleet, figures out who has certain metadata, and then I can do a health check to see if the kubelet's alive, and if so, I can register with Kubernetes. So let's look at that unit file really quick. Uh, let's call it kube register. So here this thing says, hey, we're going to look for any machine that has this role called Kubernetes. I'm going to talk to Fleet on one of the servers um, on this Fleet socket, and then I know that I'm going to do a health check on the Kubernetes machine on this health check port, and then if it says it's healthy, I'm going to consider it ready to be scheduled uh, or added to Kubernetes. And here's my API endpoint. So if I'm looking for the API on localhost, you know what? Maybe I should just deploy this thing wherever the API server is. So we'll just say fleet CTL starts kube register. So once kube register enters the uh, the cluster, 
Let's make sure that it's actually running. So these are the logs from the um, journal, and it looks like it registered all four machines. So now if we run that command again, get to nodes, there. All right, so now they've all been added to Kubernetes. Now we actually have some capacity in our cluster to actually do some work. Now let's say we didn't add these nodes and we created some jobs for Kubernetes. They would just sit there because there's no resources available until we added some. Right? So now we have those online. We need to talk about a real world example. So we bootstrap our cluster from the ground up, right? Docker and all the components required. That's everything. There's no magic there. So now you have, actually have a real working cluster. So now we want to deploy a real world dish app, right? So I'm not going to do a hello world. That usually pisses people off at meetups. It's like, dude, hello world. Everything works with just hello. So we're going to try to do something a little bit more advanced. So details about the cluster. Um, I have five virtual machines that got spin up. There, um, there's no internet connectivity on my laptop, so we need everything to work behind the firewall. This is usually the hard case that most people hand wave around. So, oh, you have a firewall. <laughs> Use the cloud. And then we have cross-host networking, and we're running the latest stable version of Kubernetes, which is like 0, 15 something, and we're running Docker 1.6. The app we have is called PGView. Very simple application. The only thing it does is connect to Postgres and get all of its features that it supports and returns a blob of JSON. Most people think that's simple, but there's like a thousand companies that are funded right now that do exactly that. They go get some JSON for you and like sell it to you. Right? Um, you laugh because you're probably working at a place like, like damn it, that was our serious <laughs> um, So the requirements for this app, so you know, we're at this company, we're starting our business. We're right? going to start a startup based on PGView. We're going to do Postgres information as a service. Silliness, but probably someone will fund us. And, we're going to make it, so the requirements for this app is it needs to be horizontally scalable, right? So if we go with one app, we need to scale it out. Um, and also we want a dedicated NimCache instance, right? Because I want to cache the results from Postgres. There's no reason to ask Postgres the same question a thousand times. I hit it, I want to cache it locally, and I'll just serve from a cache after that. And I, logically, I need a Postgres database, so someone needs to give me the credentials for Postgres. Um, and one thing that I want to have is automated service discovery. I do not want to manually configure PG view with the, where the destination of Postgres is, or the username, or the password. And then I want some magic. I want zero downtime application upgrades. This usually doesn't work at all in real life, but you can get really, really close if you have good APIs. Here's what PG view looks like. Um, it's a basic Go service that implements some RPC endpoints, like its version, and the actual function call called SQL features. And if you hit it, it will come back with all the SQL features. Um, this is an actual response, or at least a, a partial response from uh, Postgres. So uh, maybe Hacker News 15, 20 years ago, these would have been at the top, like new version of COBOL or something. Um, but uh, Postgres still supports these languages, so um, your job is still secure. All right. Someone now is like, COBOL. COBOL specialist. This would be like a new version of Fortran release. Like in 2012, IBM cut a new version of Fortran. It was like a, eight people in the world were celebrating. <laughs> huh? I don't know if you can add new features to Fortran. You use Fortran, I'm sorry. They are rich as hell right now. Like you call someone and it's like, we have this Fortran app. Ooh. You can pay me in stock options. <laughs> yes. Fortran is actually good for a lot of stuff, so let's not talk about it. It's like actually really, really fast for a lot of things. I actually actually uh, write a lot of code that did pack decimal and epsodic, mainly because the mainframe screen if you give it that type of data. You give a mainframe JSON, it gets really, really hot. And they don't like that. You got to give like, what is this JSON ASCII? What are you doing? Epsodic, pack decimal. You're wasting bits, nibbles. I was like, oh, what's a nibble? Half a bit. I'm like, okay, sweet, I'll do that. <laughs> All right, cool. So now that we have that, we're going to deploy our app, right? So we just got funding. The VC thinks this is a great idea. So we can go with it. So we wrote this app. So the first thing we need to do is set up a database. So now what we're going to do is set up a database as a pod. Um, really simple. We have this Postgres database. And really quick, this is a pod description. We're going to give it labels. It's in production. It has Postgres. And then we have a data volume. It needs to store its data somewhere. We don't want to have that data in the container because you kill the container. You lose all your data. It's a very big surprise for people the very first time. 
So what we want to do is use the data volume from the host. Every single time he was like, hey, kill the container. Where's my data? It's like, it's gone. <laughs> it's a feature. That could be a feature. So what we can do is just give it a volume on the host. Kubernetes does support like dynamic volume. So if you're in the cloud or something, you can say, hey, give me a dynamically allocated created volume from GCE or Amazon and attach that to the host. Um, later versions of Kubernetes are going to make those volumes first class citizens. So you have an iSCSI line or target and maybe something with network <coughs> integration. So that way we can raise the profile of what volume is and you can reference one of those volumes by ID to make sure that you land on the server that actually has the volume. A lot of people have this idea that they want to swing volumes to servers just randomly. I was like, you know, you, you move a block device to a different server and someone writes to it. That's it. It's gone. Right? You can corrupt the, the, the volume that way. You've got to be careful. Right? You just can't do magic clustering by moving block devices around. Can you trust that when your um, cluster member dies, that your block device will remain the same? No way. Uh -huh. I don't know. This is what people I say, go ahead and try that. And they're like, dude, where did my data go? I was like, ha-ha. Can you repeat the question? What was the I question? made it disappear. <laughs> you shouldn't trust me. OK. All right, so Postgres, um, we're going to give it the image name. So a lot of you may know that in the image name, you have to include the URL. So I'm running a Docker registry on my Mac. So the URL is going to be that IP and this port is going to go to my Mac. I have no internet access. We grab the Postgres container. Here's the port that I care about. I'm doing something very silly right now. I'm setting the Postgres password with an environment variable in a clear text file. If you do this, you will be on like your late night news explaining why you got hacked. <laughs> Don't do this. This is good for this demo. Right? What we're going to do is reference that volume that we created on the host here. So that way we bind mount it into the container. Right? So when this thing fires up, it's going to set its password. And ideally, we can share that information with other machines. Right? So we need to launch this now. So kube ctl um, create-f pods and Postgres. Right, so we have a pod now. So what's going to happen is a kubelet's going to get this. We've got to schedule it. Um, and I don't really care where it lands. It just needs to stay there once it does. So we'll do a kube, kube ctl get pods. So now we have this pod. Um, it's pending, so it's probably talking to Docker and trying to pull it down. And what's actually happening here is Kubernetes creates what we call a network uh, pod. And it sits there. It's basically like a no-op container, just paws and blocks. And that's the thing that gets configured with the IP address. And once it has an IP address, you can tell Docker, any other containers that are composed of this pod, join them to the namespace of the network container. That means we don't have to configure one container and join the others up. And this is how they can refer to each other on local host. We only need one IP for a collection of containers. So now it's up and running. Here's the IP to that pod. But we don't want to use that directly, right? Because if we move this database, then people have to be updated with it. So we're going to create a service for uh, the database. Um, so what we can do is look at services. And here's what a service looks like. Very simple. Um, so basically, it's another object in Kubernetes. We can say that um, we don't know the IP ahead of time. So when we bootstrapped the API server, we gave it a network range. We said, you know what? This range used to allocate portal IPs. These can be public IPs. Um, these could be um, just private IPs, and you, you require L3 routing to actually hit them. We'll see what that looks like. I won't do too much hand waving there. And then here, um, we have the selected. Remember when I talked about service discovery? When someone hits this IP that we will soon get allocated, this service will do a label query lookup in Kubernetes and say, show me all the pods that have in the environment production and Postgres. There's only one pod that's going to map to, and they can send traffic there. So we'll do kubectl, um, and then we'll create that service. So what happens now, uh, get services, just type in a weird angle. So we get an IP allocated from our pool, and now we have a way to talk to um, our Postgres database from a service IP. Now, in addition to the service IP, if I was running the DNS server, we can also get a DNS entry for Postgres, it'll be something like postgres.kubernetes.local or something. So apps can refer to it by its DNS name that will resolve. But the problem is, I'm outside of the cluster on my laptop, and I want to hit this IP address. I have no route entry for this IP, so if I try to send a packet there, it's going to fail. 
So let's see what that looks like we try to do that. So PSQL, the host that we want to hit. So this is a command line client for Postgres. We want to hit that with this particular user, Postgres. We can't hit it, right? So the reason why is we have no route into that place. We don't know where to go, right? So what you would do on the edge network, if you had really fancy equipment, you can put the route entries and do stack routes into the cluster. You can go specifically where Postgres is running. But remember, we have that proxy right on every machine. And what happens is on each machine, there's an IP tables rule that says anything for this destination goes to the proxy server, and its job is to figure out where to go. So what we can do on my Mac is I'm just going to add a static route um, to route. This just runs a little command to just add a route locally. So I just said, hey, route.add 10.10 um, .10, and go to any node in the cluster. It really doesn't matter. I don't care because it's just going to bounce it to the right place. So if we try this again, if that's working, then we can actually hit it and make the connection. So it's going through the full uh, loop there. So that's our service discovery. Now we can talk about Postgres in terms of that fit, or if we're using DNS to DNS thing. All right, so now we have our database, and now we have our database as a service. So now that's what we give to any <coughs> the service IP. We're free to do upgrades here. So you can imagine getting fancy here. You can have a service IP map to like a proxy server for your database that can speak Postgres or just translate it. If you're doing maintenance work, you can block that request, do your database migration or maintenance, and then fulfill the request. You can kind of queue these things up. You can get really smart on the edge if you start introducing proxies into the network. So the next thing we want to do is deploy our awesome app. VCs are getting anxious now. I gave you this money. Where's the app? So I've got an app. I'll show it to you. <laughs> deploy it. Give me a second. So, what we do is we're going to use a replication controller because the goal here is that we can scale this horizontally. If we use a pod, we won't have that guarantee. At least it won't be easy. So we'll use a replication controller. So PG view, um, stable, version 1 of the application. So what this looks like is a little bit different than a pod itself. Right here we're describing a replication controller. And its job is to satisfy our spec. Here we're saying that the name of the replication controller would be PG view stable 1. Um, the labels that it cares about so it's going to pay attention to pods that match that label. Very similar pattern that the service proxy uses. And now we have a specification. So, hey, replication controller, I want you to ensure that there's at least, right now, one of these pods on the network. So here's a template. So here's the selector. We can say that these are the things that we want to select. And here's our template. So anything that we spin up is going to have these labels. In this case, I have no volumes for this particular pod. We want the PG view application and some resource limits. And then we want a memcache container as well in the same pod. So this is an example of having multiple containers in one logical pod, in one logical service, right? So these things get scheduled together. When you're coupled that way, you share um, network namespace. So I can address each other on local host. Um, so now we have a pod. So let's just look at the source code really quick for the PG view app so you can kind of see how I'm referencing Postgres and what it looks like. Um, so go a little app that I wrote, source, GitHub, Kelsey Hightower, PG view, main.go. And we'll zoom past some of this other stuff and just look at main. So notice here at main, the way I figure out what Postgres is most important supposed to connect to. Kubernetes, when it launches a pod, it will inject all the service IPs and ports in your namespace. We haven't been using namespace so far, but we're in the default one. We can imagine giving different people in your organization different namespaces, so that way they can have their own Postgres hosting URLs. And they're just injected as environment variables. Yeah, DNS installed, you can use DNS, but I find this really, really easy to do in this pattern. And then you just connect like normal. And when it comes to memcache, well, I know memcache is localhost because we're in the same pod together, so I'll just reference it on localhost. I don't need to find it. And then we make a request, and then we store it in memcache to make the next request fast. So now we can deploy this controller. Um, so now what we want to do is create replication controller PG view stable one. So now the replication controller goes. We didn't deploy a pod here. We deployed a controller. And the controller is responsible for meeting our specification. Our specification right now is one pod. So we do kubectl git. Um, replication controllers. So its job is to make one replica of a container with that specification. Coup CTL get uh, pods. And we'll see that it did its job. It looked in the Kubernetes API. It didn't find any pods matching that set of labels. So it created one. 
And here, uh, is it running? So it's actually up and running. But again, we don't want to address this plot with this IP address. We're going to create a service for that as well. And this is key so we can scale this thing out without having to track all the individual IPs. We'll just do that really quick. It looks very similar to the other one, so I won't show it. Services, uh, PG view. Uh, stay, uh, PG view. Here we go. Actually, it's probably worth looking at because the way this one works. So this service only cares about two labels. You need to have a PG view app and your environment needs to be production. If you meet those two requirements, I will proxy traffic to you. All right, this is going to be key when we start talking about doing rollouts with the canary pattern. We introduce a new version of the app and a separate controller, but we want the same service proxy to find both of them using a subset of the labels. So now that we have a service in place, we can ask Kubernetes what the service is. Even though I'm doing all this on the command line, most people will probably use just the API directly and build some UIs on the phone. So here's the PG view API. Now what we can do is hit this. So I'll go to another tab. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So we can do, um, let's try to make one of these RPC calls. So we'll do um, add RPC. And then we'll just get the version for now. So we've got the version, it's one out of the application. And now what we want to do is look and see if it actually connects to Postgres, right? SQL features is the endpoint. So I introduced a 10 second sleep to mimic a slow query. Like, you do this query, it's going to take you 10 seconds, right? But the next query is fast, right? Now it's a memcache. We're going quick now. So the service is doing what it needs to do, right? And we didn't have to configure it with like where Postgres is. We got service discovery kind of built in. So now what we want to do is mimic uh, the customer experience. So while true, can I write bash? While true, do that, right? And then we're going to sleep for a second. So this is what customers were seeing. All the customers to our service are hitting this. So we got our mom, our dad, our uncle. That's what you do as a startup. You get your family members to use the service. So you can say you have users. So <laughs> we have users, um, no paying customers, and we got users. And we get lucky, um, they put our awesome app on Hacker News, and now we get our first paying customer. Two years later, but that's okay. So, so what we do here is uh, developers are like, we need more capacity. 10 more minutes? Oh man, we gotta go fast. All right, 10 more minutes. We're gonna do a speed this thing up. <coughs> so, Kubectl, CTL, create our, let's do resize. Resize, um, we want replicas to be three uh, for our replication controller. Let's do PG view, stable, V1. I want to resize it. All right, so now it's resize, Go CTL, uh, git, pause, what are you doing? I'm in the middle of a production deployment here. All right, I'll take it. <laughs> now we get three of the apps, right? We change the definition, now we have three of them in place. So now they're up and running, right? So now, um, are they started? Yes, they're all running. What does the customer see? One well, not we're still good. So the developers are doing a good job here. Now they want to go to 2.0. We don't trust them, so we're going to do a canary pattern. I'm going to deliver a canary where we say, uh, let's just do a new replication controller. The only difference with this replication controller is going to be 2.0 of the app. So we'll do um, replication controllers, uh, PG view canary, right? We'll create that. So what should happen is it's going to spin up a new pod. So kube ctl, ctl git replication controllers. You see the specification here, slightly different version. Kube ctl git pods. And you'll see that um, it's actually running. So what does the customer see? Some customers now are seeing 2.0. There we go. So the replication is looking good. The users, the developers haven't broken everything. So it's like, all right, we trust you now. We're going to roll 2.0 across the entire fleet. <clears throat> so let's do that. So what we need to do here, and people are, are, they see how this works, right? Like that service thing only needs a subset of those labels, right? And if you really needed a customer to uh, hit the other one, you could just do another service. So let's do a PG view canary, right? And then uh, crew CTL get services. Ah, there we go. And then here's the canary IP. So you could actually just give people that. That's just one that one, right? So we could go over here and say uh, curl hd rpc. 
understand Great, so it works. So now you only hit 2.0 because the other service proxy cares and needs another label to track, right? All right, so that's in place. So now we're gonna do the rolling upgrade. This is the final part. So coup CTO, we're gonna do a rolling update and then we want to have a, um, a update period of three seconds and we wanna update the uh, PG view stable uh, version one. We want to use a new one that has everything we need. So replication controller, PGU stable, V2. What's going to happen here now is that we're going to coordinate some API calls. Now the client just makes this really convenient for us, but you could do this yourself and just orchestrate. Kill some pods on this one controller, set it to two, spin this on one up to one. And you do this until your deployment is complete. So what happens is now we're orchestrating via API calls the replacement of two replication controllers. We leave them up at the same time, so if they have the same labels, the service pressures to continue the work. So we're starting to see that roll up. 50% of our traffic is now 2.0. Things are rolling, the proxy is hitting things, now the majority of the traffic is 2.0. And eventually, all of our traffic will be on 2.0. We're almost there, let's see, this thing is done. Right, so the last iteration is going. Um, there's zero replicas on one controller. We're at the end of the loop, and we should be done now. We'll pass this health check, and now the entire cluster has rolled to two out of. And with that, that's the end of the demo. Thank you. Yeah, we have time for questions. Getting a microphone to pass around. Sweet. Was that helpful for people? Yeah. Good. Looking at a mic and everything. So with the routes that you put on each node in the cluster, uh, how does that how does that handle when you get to say a thousand, ten thousand nodes? So you have like 10,000 host routes. Uh, question. So the question was, how do you scale the routes for the, for the node? Just to get 10,000 of these, how do you scale it? This is why we're giving each host a subnet. So we give a host a subnet, we cut that dramatically by saying, we'll give you 256 addresses. So you divide 10,000 by 256 is so much you larger. Can have 10, 000, yeah. or you can have 256 pods on, on each node. Mm -hmm. But how does the, each node respond to having uh, having to have routes to 10,000 other nodes. So actually, Linus can actually do hundreds of thousands of routes. Okay. There's some networking equipment that uses just the Linus kernel in general. It's not that expensive because the routing table is in the kernel. Yep. All it does is just a lookup table, right? So it might be some overhead on memory, but it's not that much as you would think. But we scale that down. So if you have 10,000 machines, um, you, they would just have ranges, and you say, hey, you do your lookup, and you fire the packet where it needs to go. This is actually not a problem at all for the Linus kernel. Good question. Any other questions? Take this one over. <coughs> so in the beginning of your demo, you deployed at CD um, on a specific machine. Mm -hmm. um, what would happen if this machine crashed and you could recover it? Would you like, um, recover your cluster? Yeah, so the good thing is, so um, the one thing that you would probably lose is the cluster state, but none of your pods would go down. Those replication controls would be gone. So the pods will continue running. It's the guys doing enforcement won't know what to do, so they just will take no new actions. If you bring it back up, the liveliness checks will come back, but you notice I was storing things in files. So those files are like a source of truth, like I can check those into GitHub, and I can just add those definitions back, right? But normally you would run etcd on like five nodes, so you know losing all five in different failure domains, if you have that problem, man, your data center's probably down. And like etcd and losing that state is at least your worries. You need to bring your data center back up. But yeah, you gotta protect that stuff, right? But the other data that's in there, Flannel will just keep putting it back. So we need to blow that away, Flannel just puts it back. Um, you would just have to put in your new state, so those replication controls, we gotta put that back, right? And actually we have a way, we're thinking about a tool that can take the current state of a cluster and regenerate a replication controller before you put it back. All right, so there's, there's different things you can do there. Good question. Good question here. 
here and then here, or here, here, here. Or maybe start with back and through there. There we go. Okay, and uh, your demo you showed you use IPv4. Can you use IPv6? IPv6 will totally work. Doctor supports it. Uh, Kubernetes makes no opinion about it. So if you do have IPv6, it should just work just fine. It's just that we have to train Docker, uh, well, actually Docker 1.4 at IPv6 support. So it's a matter of us just saying, let's do that by default. Flannel supports IPv6. Um, so the idea now, I think, is just really is to get the ecosystem prepped for it. Maybe, we, maybe I should try on my next demo, just use IPv6 across the board, because ideally it should just work. Good question. It's just a, a lot of the cloud providers, surprisingly, don't support IPv6. Right, so this is terrible. So if you have a development cluster for your uh, developers and they're, you know, they're producing their features and they want to deploy their branch for other people to test, how do they separate out their containers and pods, etc., so that they're not interfering with each other? Is it namespaces or something else? Good question. So the question was, if you have a group of developers sharing a shared cluster, you know, you've got one group of hardware, you want to partition that in a way that the testing um, work doesn't interfere with the production work, there's a couple ways you do it. Me, logically, I would probably have a different cluster, maybe smaller VM, something on Amazon or something, just to be safe. Like, trying to do this in the same production cluster is probably just a bad idea. But if you only had one set of hardware and you had to do this, you could use namespacing, but you can also put selectors on the nodes. So if you have a thousand nodes, you may say that these nodes, 10 nodes, are reserved for developers. And then when they schedule things, and then you can actually add a node selector to the pod and say that the selector must find a node that has this metadata. Environment equals development. And then the production services require environment equals production. So then you can kind of filter it at the machine level. You can take it one step further and use a namespace in, in Kubernetes to say, you can deploy stuff to your namespace, but the namespace doesn't protect you from scheduling to the same machine. So if you want to do that, you need to probably partition by the node selector. I think Google does this, you can do policy enforcement. This thing can only run in the development allocator resources. If you do commingle on the same machine, you can use C groups to try to figure out what resources people get. But C groups is really weird because it's, it's like cumulative, right? So you can say a thousand CPU shares, right? And it's all relative. If everyone says a thousand and there's 10 of them, I got 110. New guy comes in and he says 1 million. So now everyone's down to like 1% of stuff and you're screwed. So I think just have a better logical separation at the node selector, namespaces, and then finally C groups if everyone plays nice. Good question. Uh, yeah, so from the application development perspective, uh, you said that it makes no, make no sense to put uh, all Ubuntu on the Docker image. So is there some tools or best practice for the software developer to, to package a minimal application and the kernel and libraries? So the question was, it doesn't make sense to you know, use Ubuntu um, to build your application container. To be honest, I shouldn't have said that. Like the fact that people are adopting containers is a great step forward from what the mess we made years ago, right? Like all this magic and scripts, if we can get to a logical format, I think it's okay to start that way. Docker tries to mitigate this by caching some of the layers. There's a lot of drawback from this, right? A lot of people don't update those base containers. I assume the developers do from Ubuntu a year ago, and it's the same cache Ubuntu image. No updates, right? This is pretty bad. So right now we have some tools in the Go community because it's easy. You can take a Go project and just do um, like Docker to ACI and just produce a, a root file system from just a Docker source tree, I mean a Go source tree. Um, maybe in the future you start seeing some like tighter integration to runtime. What I personally do is do a Go static binary. I build that in a normal CI system and I just do Docker app. My one binary in place and I don't include all this other garbage. You can do this in Rust. And I think in Ruby there's this project called Traveling Ruby that gives you the same semantics. Statically compiles and links Ruby itself some popular gems, some popular C extensions. You add your app, and now you have this one big static thing that you can push around. So I think the tools will mature over time if people get tired of pushing around two gig containers. So there's no, um, I guess, standard on it. You can look up Billroot. So this is probably the one that's the easiest to integrate into like your existing workflow. Billroot has like a make files type syntax. We can kind of describe all the things you need, and it will just build exactly that and it'll be much smaller. So most people can even build a MySQL container <coughs> using their build root till, uh, tool chain. And you probably end up with like a 30 meg container versus a one gig container. So check that out. Good question. Uh, 
Oh, we're here. This one way. Oh, yeah, the mic is nice. Um, so you said there's no SSHing in containers, so how will I do like one-time jobs, like if I have to clean up something in the database or uh, do some other stuff that has only to rerun once and then it's done? So the question is, there's no SSH and you want to do some one-time action to the database. But what is the action you want to do to the database? Yeah, cleaning some records or, yeah. Yeah, so luckily... Something is messed up, messed up so... So luckily the database usually has like a, like a remote thing you can run, right? You can run some admin and SQL commands. I would prefer that. Like most apps have a way of you interacting with them. Most people don't log into the system because they're not sure what the config is. It's like, what'd you put there? And you start snooping around. So this is why I like this new movement where we're taking the config files and we're putting them in like etcd. So you look at etcd and you see the config file. I have like a configuration tool called copd that I wrote that can take things out of etcd and put them on the file system. So that way you can, like, if your app still reads from the file system, you can do that. But ideally, remember, if we, if we were to think about designing systems that we could never log in, you would, be, you would probably do a different way of doing this, right? You would probably build tools that knew how to pull the application logs like we saw earlier. You would probably have tools that know how to give you the authority source of the configuration, push that configuration in place. And if you run an app, I should have an endpoint on your app that says, hey, what configuration are you using? So if I hit this endpoint, you should tell me what you loaded last. You should tell me if you're healthy. This is where we want to get to. It's going to take time. But for a lot of people that are running things like this very successfully, they've moved those patterns into the app itself, right? You can debug it. But if you really wanted to do it, right, these are just containers. So you can just SSH into the box. If you took it out of production, you really want to troubleshoot it, you can SSH into the server and then do something like Docker enter to enter the namespace of the database and then poke around all you want to. So you can totally do that. Like, that works. There's no reason for you to put SSH in the container itself. Yeah, the, the question was not uh, so strong about SSH into, but uh, yeah, like having jobs scheduled that do we do one type stuff like uh, maybe have a cron job uh, I need to do, uh, do it on a regular basis. Like one shot job. So one shot job. So. Yeah, yeah, so you can build your own controller if you wanted to. Right now we don't have like native support for one shot jobs in Kubernetes, but ideally you could do a pod that works that way. So in a pod, there is no replication controller to manage it. So you can deploy a pod, let it run when it dies, that's it. No one's going to restart it for you. So you could use a pod as a primitive to do one shot. Schedule this pod, it runs, that's it, it's dead. No one's going to take care of it. So you can do that today. Or you can build a controller that's a little bit smarter about how to handle that. You had one already, man. Five minutes? Oh, that's a lot of time. We went from 10 to like 15, really like magically. This is the question for Ah, of cool. course. This is related to the previous question. Is there anything like Kronos or is that Binance or anything like Kronos? No, and I was actually talking to the Mesos guys before I left here. And I think what's happening now is like Mesos has a lot of these things. They have Marathon for like longer running stuff. They have Kronos for like the crime drop stuff, right? And Kubernetes will absolutely gain those features. So the day, some of the announcements that just came out today there, they just sent our West thingy. You know, Kronos is already there. But you can probably just do this with your own controller. I've seen custom controls already. You know, you put, so Kubernetes is going to gain the ability to have you put custom API data into the API service, right? So you can have your custom format, you drop it in there, and now Kubernetes will understand this new schema. You won't do anything with it, you'll just house it. And then you can actually have a command line client that pushes into the schema, and then have your app that actually knows about this, just looks at it and says, oh, I see cron jobs that need to be scheduled, and just do it yourself, right? So it's flexible in that way, but I'm pretty sure the Kubernetes team will say, yeah, we need this as well. Today you can use Chrome. <coughs> but then we have time for maybe two more, and that's it. <coughs> Are there log files in this new container world, and how do I get, uh, how do you get the log file? You want your log file? Sweet. Um, so I think um, everybody wants a damn log file. <coughs> so uh, we can do like kube ctl uh, log. Uh, Postgres, they'll grab its logs from the container. Is that what you want? Yeah. That makes you happy. He's smiling. Like <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All the logs you want. <laughs> yeah, so any of the pods, you just give it its pod name, and it will go get the logs because it just has a standard out from Docker. So the thing there, in order for this to work, though, you need to be doing like that 12-factor pattern where you're logging a standard out, then other tools can intercept the stuff. <coughs> cool. I think we're out of time. So uh, thank you guys for coming. I'll be around. Um, thank you.